Bryden, author of two books, Period Repair Manual and Hormone Repair Manual and Period Revolutionary. <laughs> it's so good to speak with you and um, just tell me what you're looking at. What's, yeah. are you, have you got a window where you are? What's, oh, what's yeah. the world like? <laughs> It's really great to see you. Just for everyone watching, Lucy and I met in person three years ago, almost exactly, well, not quite three years ago in your lovely hometown, which was my first time there in Perth. And yeah, so I feel a real, I feel a real connection with you, I think in part because we met in person. So mm. I am, today I'm in Christchurch, New Zealand, which is my adopted hometown. I'm looking out at my little suburban garden with the bees buzzing around our lemon tree and <laughs> yeah. it's good bees in New Zealand I feel like the bees there are just they're deluxe bees they're not just yeah. ordinary little bees they're like these huge big I guess they're bumblebees it's true we have some big bumblebees so, big bumblebees yeah. and just definitely in the mood to talk about our favorite topic which is periods and yes no yes. surprise <laughs> Okay, my next question, and you can answer this however you like, um, is not how are you, but what day are you? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting one for me because mm. two months ago, mm -hmm. I graduated to menopause. So I achieved my one year without a period. I'm right on time, pretty much. I'm 52. So that was like, Yep. I, I, my body decided to be exactly average in terms of the day, the, you know, the age of stopping periods. So yeah, I don't, this is now second girlhood. As you might know, I talk about in my book. I mean, I, this is the way I, my new way of seeing female, the female body is we have, we have this sort of baseline physiology, which is childhood and then menopause, which is lower hormones. And then we go through a very important time, special time, 35 to 40 years of hormonal fireworks. And we get to do all the, all the making of hormones, whether that's with a monthly cycle or, and, or pregnancies. I mean, they're both amazing sources of hormones and we need to do that for building metabolic reserve. It's really important for general health to mm -hmm. have a number of years of natural menstrual cycles, but then you kind of get out the other side of it and it, that all has to end at what, at some point, I actually think it makes it even more special that it has to end. So mm -hmm. when you're in the middle of it and enjoying menstrual cycles, then yeah, cherish them while they're, while they're happening. Mm. There's two things that you said just then that I really love. And one is um, that you achieve menopause. Yes. Yeah. Like even just hearing you say that, yeah. it, I feel like it's, it does something to my nervous system. It's like, yeah. ooh, that's, yeah. that's ahead of me. That's the road that I'm on now. And it is something to be cherished while I'm in it, but to be achieved once I'm on the other side of it. Yeah for sure and the achievement yeah. is partly having got through the years of perimenopause which is as anyone listening who's in their late 40s would know that can be it can be a little rough um mm. in terms of hormonal symptoms not for everyone but sometimes but coming through that and then you get to what I, I call second girlhood mm. and I do talk a little bit in my second book hormone repair manual about this second girlhood and this mm. kind of it seems quite common actually this interest in spending more time outside, mm. shirking duties, not caring what people think as much. It's actually sort of a reclaiming of identity that mm. some researchers have found that girls form their kind of strongest sense of self around the age of eight, nine, or 10. And then mm. with puberty, that, that kind of changes with the female gender role. And then, you know, 30 years later, we get to rediscover, rediscover some of that yeah girlhood you're I guess not, yep you're not climbing trees with yes. no nippers and shoplifting lollies from the corner <laughs> store <laughs> yeah getting all muddy in the garden and going on big walks and yeah 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 I remember you telling me that um a while ago that was the second thing that I loved that you said the second girlhood yeah um and, you know, I said that to someone else recently and she said oh, I had a terrible childhood I wouldn't want to have a second girlhood I thought, well, that's another interesting sort of layer to it. But <clears throat> yeah, I've been wondering, you know, just a little bit about 
what your childhood was like and what your parents were like and how they kind of let you be who you were so that you could be who you are now and then be yeah. revisiting that oh wow yeah that's a good question um I just saw my parents actually about 10 minutes ago online that we were both attending a online book launch and they were in the audience and so I was like oh there's my parents <laughs> watching for your for your book <laughs> no not for my book for a friend's book okay um my parents were so I was born in 69. So my parents were back to the earth hippies. They built a hexagon shaped house in the middle of nowhere. I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Canada. Like there were bears. I was just there like six months ago, actually. And a bear came to the window while I was giving a presentation. Like that was where I grew up. And my parents were, I guess I would say a little hands off in terms of mm. <laughs> that was that generation, right? Like growing up in mm. the seventies, you just, mm -hmm. you're kind of on your own for a lot mm. of a lot of it so yeah it was that was part of it I guess I got to explore a lot of things um that might have contributed to yeah some of the ways I view things um the other part of my childhood is I was totally fascinated with biology like from the time mm -hmm. I learned first started learning about biology when I was in like year six and constantly like explaining to my mother about like viruses and mitochondria and all the biology things and then I was determined I was going to be a biologist. I did. I was a biologist for a while. I mm -hmm. published a scientific mm -hmm. paper in biology. And then mm -hmm. at some point I just had the calling to actually, I want to work with people. I want to put mm -hmm. some of this knowledge into a practical application to work with people. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's what I've done. What were you publishing on um, as a biologist? What was your area? Yeah. Again? Do you, yeah, I'll tell you. Yes. Um, I wrote, I was the lead author on a scientific paper about um, for sex differences in the foraging behavior of bats. So just quickly, I'll just tell you, these are insect, insect eating bats in Canada. So I had to like put little radio tags on them and like track them with a, a transmitter through the night and the whole thing, you know, doing field biology, but this, you'll be, you'll find this interesting. So female bats, we'll put it this way. Bats in general can use something called torpor, which is a daily hibernation, which is they can just like, not even like the, you know, winter hibernation that some animals use, but they just drop into, they let their body temperature wow. drop. They, drop. Can, they can just drop straight into the dream phase. Just like, yeah, exactly. So in Canada, even during the summer, it drops to like zero degrees Celsius. So they, the, so the males go out, this is the pattern during the summer months, the males go out, feed for 20 minutes, come back, drop their body temperature to the ambient and just kick back for the rest of the night. And the females don't do that because they have, they're either gestating or they're lactating. And so they have to keep, they have to stay hot all night. They go out, they feed like three or four times, they come back, they keep their body temperature high. So that's an example of the profound difference actually mm. it, for some animals mm -hmm, between male mm -hmm. and female. And mm. you know that part of this has framed, part of this has informed one of my, feelings towards women's health is that for mm. so long there's been this narrative in science that the male body is like mm, the, the default, default the mm. normal and mm -hmm. that everything female is just kind of a side issue like a little add-on an optional extra yeah, yeah an optional extra and it's actually the reverse because mm. I would argue that the female physiology is the default standard and <laughs> yeah and males do things a little males do things a little differently and they're totally valid too but you know that male that quirky strategy of spending most of the night at ambient temperature and sleeping is yeah that's that's different it's one way of doing it yeah. yes exactly yeah. oh it's so interesting and I love yeah. that there's been um a segue to the sex differences in bats and the work that you're doing now mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's kind of it's it's a real um testament to that idea that you know, so many of us don't really ever know what we're doing, but it's just staying interested and staying curious and staying on your path. And then all of a sudden, you know, it all kind of stitches itself together and you're doing exactly what you're meant to be doing. You know what? Curiosity mm. is such a gift. And mm. I think you have it too. I see it in your work too. It's just this mm. like, yeah, genuine. I'm just genuinely curious how things work, mm. how, you know, things respond, how it's all mm. going to play out. And mm. mine is a mixture of curiosity. And also one of my key messages is trust the body because biology, mm. 
our own biology is pretty smart. Mm. And a lot of the time, I won't say every single time, but a lot of the time, if you just give the body what it needs, like some real basic things, like eating enough and just some of the right nutrients and some downtime, mm-hmm. some rest time and, you know, proper circadian rhythm and getting light and dark at the right time that can translate into better periods. Mm. And yeah, it's, it's not, women's health is not as complicated as we've mm-hmm. been led to believe. Yeah, I love how often you talk about that and how, you know, particularly with younger women and menstruators, it's often um, considered just too complicated and too much information to give them when actually it's such a powerful time in your life to know what the heck is going on. And if we had all of that information that you just reeled off in 30 seconds, then you would um, have a more innate understanding of, of, of how it how it all connects to take care of yourself sort of out here and in here and then how it all feeds into each other yeah and you know the you know the phrase body literacy Mm. body literacy is a great concept Mm. it was there's an essay on my um, website about by the essentially the woman who coined that term okay okay. she's, she's a friend of mine and it's about fundamentally body literacy, the way she meant it back in the 90s when she had this radical newsletter about menstruation activism. We tend to think menstruation activism is new, but it's not. Mm, I mean, there were some mm. pretty cool women yeah. doing some pretty cool stuff in the 80s and 90s mm. and beyond, before that. Mm. And she coined that term. It's really about knowing kind of if and when you ovulate and where you are in your cycle, which is what you mm. do now. It's just, just that mm-hmm. basic understanding, mm. which is very empowering. And mm. yeah, it really can't be overstated. It's just, it's mm. such, and it's such a simple thing. And we do, we have come through quite a paternalistic time when mm. I think the attitude to people in general, but to women in particular was, oh, don't, that's too complicated for you to think about. So mm. just don't worry about it. You know, we're not going to try to, we're not going to explain. We'll just so, turn it off. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. switch it off with hormonal birth control. Of course, that's another mm. part of the story. Mm. Big part of the story. Oh, so much to talk about. <laughs> um, one thing I wanted to, um, I swore I'd never say circle back, but I'm going to say <laughs> it. One thing that I want to circle back to is, you know, you said that you've achieved menopause it's been two months since it's been a year since yes. you had a cycle. Correct. My okay. last period was over a year ago. Yes. Yeah. Do you still feel cyclical? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, maybe slightly. Women do report that. And I think what happens actually, and I've had this confirmed by the endocrinology professor, Geraldine Pryor, who helped me with both books. She does, she talks about how the ovarian follicles, the eggs, which is what, which are what make estrogen. So Mm -hmm. they, even once they're they're done with ovulating, they do kind of keep a little wave of estrogen going up and down. It's, it's obviously much smaller. It's about only about 10% of the estrogen we make when we're of reproductive age, but it's there, it's kind of going up and down. So I don't feel that much myself that much individually, but I think it's probably there. And also, of course, we have other rhythms, right? Like there's Mm. um, daily rhythms, which are actually Mm -hmm. quite important as Mm -hmm. well. The moon. Yep. I mean, yeah, I just, I love the idea that when you are in your menstruating years, you're really practicing, um, all of the parts of you and one thing that you always talk about is how important the menstrual cycle is not just for making babies which is often the way it's reduced to in an educational context mm-hmm. which I think a lot of you know I don't know 10 12 even 15 year olds might sort of hear and feel is quite abstract and then yeah. therefore something that they don't really relate to or connect to and they see the graph and they're like mm, they're just <laughs> yeah. lines on a page But, um, you know, you are always talking about how important it is for your health more generally. And one way that I like to think of it is that you, yeah, you're practicing, you know, in the dream phase and the menstrual phase, how to rest deeply and how to care for yourself and how to restore. And um, in the do phase, 
just what I call it when you're yes. pre-ovulatory yeah. you're rising estrogen and you're like come on like let me at yeah. it I'm ready to go and you're climbing the mountain and then the give phase once you've ovulated and you're making progesterone and mm-hmm. you just got the world on a string and then the take phase when you're coming down the mountain and you're kind of running out of f's to give and you know you've got to really set boundaries and you've got to learn how to channel those yeah. prickly feelings and you know figure out ways of returning to yourself and I love this idea and you can tell me whether I'm really stretching the bow here but I love this idea that in your menstruating years you're practicing all of those parts of you Mm -hmm. that make up who you are and then once you achieve menopause you don't need the blood anymore to remind you you don't Mm -hmm. need the kind of physiological heights of ovulation to kind of take you there you kind of know that landscape for yourself and you know all of those parts and you can use them when you need to and you still have that I don't know maybe it's an embodied memory of right. that rhythm well in your analogy and it's beautiful I love it it's it's like your your period taught you all mm. the different mm. parts of of being you and so yeah once mm. you have that knowledge moving forward into menopause you perhaps don't need need that teaching as much yeah I think that's a nice Mm, way to mm. speak I love your different phases I think yeah I think they're beautiful Mm. I think a lot of that is too it's about yeah we don't have to be the same every day and we don't Mm. have to I mean we don't have this pressure to always be on Mm. and I I do love the in your writing and most people want to talk about that premenstrual kind of luteal phase just having permission to Mm. it's okay if you feel a little more introverted that's totally Mm. normal it doesn't mean you can still go to work and you can still get things Mm. done it doesn't mean you're incapacitated but if Mm. if you just feel a little differently that's normal it's also normal to be hungrier Mm. during that premenstrual phase that's something Mm -hmm. I like a message I like to get out there as well it's just eat more Mm. it's it's not complicated like you don't have to fight it you don't have to feel guilty yeah Yeah. (laughs) just eat and it's like (laughs) it's so cruel that that often coincides with maybe particularly for younger people a time where you're more critical of your body of your behavior of you know maybe even your eating and then you actually physiologically your metabolism is higher you need more food you're about to do this huge thing and then you're like oh you know flagellating for being hungry like it's like hunger is normal hunger Mm. is healthy even for a woman, <laughs> mm. what I wrote in a blog post one time. Yeah. So we have this expectation that hunger is, yeah, somehow it's not, it's not dainty. Yeah. It's not allowed. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was I going to ask you next? Yeah. So, okay. So practicing the power, achieving menopause. Um, I wanted to ask you some questions uh, through the lens of the cycle. So if we're talking about the dream phase and, you know, a time for rest and recovery and nourishment, how do you do the work that you do, be a period revolutionary? How do you rest, restore, take care of yourself? Yeah, well, for me personally, and again, this is going to be quite different for different individuals, but as you probably know, anyone who follows me on social media, know that I walk a ridiculous Mm. amount. (laughs) Like I reward myself with a walk. And then, Mm. you know, my husband will say, it's like, how many, is this your second or your third walk today? I've sort of lost track. (laughs) These aren't always big ones, but like, I was ever worried that you just won't come back. You'll just walk (laughs) off. You'll be like Forrest Gump, you know, Oh, I just decided to walk up the South Island. Yeah. And I just did my first solo overnight hike. Um, a couple of months or a month or so ago, which I really loved. Who knew that just spending three days totally on my own walking day after day would be so great, but it was, so that's me. I mean, but I mean, that doesn't mean everyone has to do that. I, I do yoga. No, I am asking you about yeah. you. And actually that's a great segue into the do phase because, yeah. and can I just ask, was going on the solo walk part of um, achieving menopause or was, was that just a coincidence that it was around that time or like you were like I've achieved menopause I'm going into the woods alone I'm gonna like well it turned out that we worked out that way and mm. even though I don't know if I consciously did that but I was very motivated to make that mm. walk happen and mm. yeah I just really did quite a lot to make that happen so I think maybe it was at some level it was a, a celebration mm. for myself Rite of passage. yeah 
Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, you go. Oh, I just said the other things I do is I take a lot of hot baths. Yeah. <laughs> and I always yeah. glom on to little, every time there's a little bit of scientific research about how hot yes. baths are good for you and they help with sleep or they help with circadian rhythm. Yeah. I'm like, that. that's why. That's yeah, yes. it's very, very soothing. Did you write in one of your books that a hot bath is, um, I'm going to get this wrong. It's like as good as an antidepressant or it's as good yeah, as a... it would have yeah. been. In, yeah, it, it, it's actually, if you time it at about, depending on your circadian rhythm, but about one mm. or two in the afternoon, it has a, it, it has a mood enhancing effect. I think like Hang long on, term. did you just tell me one or two in the afternoon? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's if you're lucky enough to be able to be at home. Yeah, you have a bath and you're at home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. And so the segue then was going into the do phase, which, you know, is, I guess it's like quite um, an extroverted time of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because I feel like lots of people have um, and maybe more issues with different parts of the cycle. And for me, this was probably where my biggest challenge was. I really felt that rise in estrogen as though um, it was like an assault. It was like I'd had three coffees and I was just like all of a sudden really like overwhelmed with the need to do all of these things. And it was like, it was quite a fizzy kind of, um, yeah, it was just a big time that I had to, it was like learning how to break in a horse. I just had to kind of learn how to just be with it and, you know. Do you know yeah. that we also get a little bump up in testosterone at that time? Yeah, yeah. It's tiny. Like when you yeah. see it on the graph, it's this tiny little, like, it's like a 10% bump yeah. up in testosterone, but women really feel that. Like, and it actually has a testosterone in the female brain actually has um quite a profound sort of anti-anxiety effect and it's just this mm. loss of inhibition is just that's mm. part of I think that mm. pre-ovulatory phase um estrogen itself is also um it, we know from the research estrogen makes you want to move your body and go outside mm. and have this mm. sort of seeking behavior of like mm. seeking out new experiences and where is my mate well it's it's obviously e- evolved for that but like yeah in, in it, we use it yeah. for lots of different things and it's, of course uh, yeah. yeah 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 it's interesting isn't it it's like still there's that kind of lean to always think about it in terms of a reproductive context but it's like this is going to inform all of the things you yeah. do, all of the projects that you do all of the metaphorical mountains that you're going to climb I like thinking about it like that that you know you start in the I don't know if you can see this, oh, you nice. start in the beautiful in the yeah. phase, sort of down this little cave, and then you're like climbing the mountain. And <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, I talked a little bit about how I struggled sometimes to kind of climb the mountain, but I wondered um, if you had anything to say about just reflecting on that part of your cycle and maybe what it's taught you, or maybe you want to talk about um, a literal mountain that you've climbed <laughs> or a metaphorical mountain that you've climbed. Well, I guess what I'll say, just hearing you talk about it, I, I do miss that ovulate, pre-ovulatory euphoria. So mm-hmm. as much as happy as I am to have achieved menopause and be here, life is a little, what's the word? The, the volumes turned down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. estrogen in particular has this, it turns up the volume on a lot mm-hmm. of things and on, on sort of emotional connection things as well. So I may mm-hmm. feel... And I say this just in a very resigned, this is how it is. I feel like the world's a little bit less perhaps sort of magical without those Mm. nice big surges of Mm -hmm. estrogen, but I'm grateful to have had them because I Mm. remember them. And so, yeah, I'll just say again, enjoy it while it's happening. Mm. I mean, this is, Mm -hmm. and this is true. I mean, just to make this point, you've alluded it to, to it a couple of times, but this is true whether you're trying to make a baby or not, or whether you Mm. even ever want a baby. It's Mm, actually mm. not about that at all. Because for example, and just, it's just a very simple analogy. We all know that testosterone is important for men. Like it's important Mm. for their bodies. It's important for their Mm. mood. It's like, that Mm. just goes without saying technically Mm. their testosterone is to make a baby. Like that's Mm. its purpose. Mm. So if we, you know, if we were going to take that angle that you really only need your ovarian function or your Mm -hmm. ovarian hormones 
when you're ready to bake, make a baby would be like saying to men, you really only need your testicular function and your mm. testosterone when you're ready to make a baby, which is crazy. Something so we would never say, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love how you say, um, yeah. If men ovulated, they'd just be yeah, talking about, talking about it. About oh, it you should have seen my ovulation. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah, I felt so strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's pretty wonderful. It's um, and I'll acknowledge. I always have to do these little. I mean, I I do get. I mean, there's some people listening who don't experience ovulation that way. That who perhaps mm. have symptoms mm. with ovulation, and that can happen. But I would say there's usually a way to sort of mm. deal with the symptoms or remove the symptoms so that you can harness the power of some of what we're mm. talking about today mm. and part of that's um having access to the ability to the to create that metabolic reserve that you're talking about yes before yeah. and i love um i think it's chapter three of your book my new, you're talking my second about book. yeah your second book yeah um cycle while you can yeah you know and i think especially for for people my age i'm 41 and yeah, I mean, I still meet people who um, they're like, yeah, well, I'm on the marina or I'm on this and I don't have to deal with it and it's great and I'm only a few years off and then, I, then I'll just be done with the whole thing. And, I mean, yeah, I always am really torn to be kind of like respectful, obviously, of their their choice, but wanting to say, you have to read this, you have to cycle away. Actually, can. Lucy, it's interesting. I'll just... I'll just point out one very simple thing which is actually you you cycle on marina especially a 40 oh yeah year old. yes yes you, okay there, oh, and why probably, especially is a 40 year old well i just because you're over you're just actually we go through this um what Dumping. professor Pryor, professor Pryor calls the ovaries grand finale there's a right. lot of the ovaries are pumping out a lot of estrogen in our early yeah. 40s and yeah. they that generally that enthusiasm of the ovaries at that time can push through and ovulate even in the presence of that low level mm -hmm. progestin drug that is in the mm -hmm. hormonal IUD. So just to be, mm -hmm. I mean, just very briefly about this, mm -hmm. all other types of mm -hmm. hormonal birth control, apart from the hormonal IUD suppress ovulation. So they suppress the menstrual cycle. And in the case of a combined estrogen method, like the pill or nivering, they suppress it completely pretty much it's like a temporary it's like a temporary chemical menopause and then so you don't have any of these ups and downs you have a a drug withdrawal bleed so in that sense um this is the compare and contrast that i always do on the pill mm. you bleed but don't cycle mm. on the hormonal iud weirdly you can actually cycle mm. but not bleed Mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. can cycling is what the little diagram you just showed that's the cycling mm -hmm, that's the mm -hmm. up and down that's what we mean by mm -hmm. cycling the bleed is just an inevitable outcome of ovulation normally mm -hmm. in a natural menstrual cycle or withdrawal bleed mm -hmm. from a combined hormonal birth control method or without getting too complicated you can also also have what are called anovulatory bleeds which are actually not uncommon so i'll just mention mm. them and that means bleeding but having not cycling so you can that can happen with on like the implant and progestin only methods the mini pill and that can happen too with pcos and that can happen in the later phases of perimenopause so cycling technically always involves ovulation because ovulation mm. is the main event mm. of the menstrual mm. cycle that said it's okay to have the occasional anovula anovulatory cycle most women do mm. and it's nothing you know the occasional one here and there doesn't mean anything bad but in general it's a good sign of health if mm -hmm. you're ovulating regularly and you can track that very mm. easily with temperatures mm. this is the democratic I'm so glad you you brought all of these yeah. little segues in because these are great this is the democratic nature of this. You don't need a doctor to confirm mm. for you that you're ovulating. You can read the signs. Well, you can start to learn to read your own signs, particularly cervical fluid or fertile mucus. You can learn to understand what that looks like. That's mm -hmm. part of body literacy. And then you could just with a cheap thermometer that you buy from your local pharmacy, a temperature under your tongue first thing in the morning when you're still in bed around the same time every day, and you can start to track that beautiful and you can see 
Mm-hmm. If and when you ovulate, your temperatures go up and they stay up for about two weeks. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. doesn't vary very much, actually. Any variability mm-hmm. in the cycle is in the pre ovulatory phase. Mm-hmm. Yes, amazing. So many things. <laughs> so the first thing was that, um, and tell me if I'm right in assuming this, the marina or the hormonal IUG is your most preferred method of hormonal birth control because it's the only one that allows you to still ovulate and therefore have a cycle yep and therefore make hormones and therefore make hormones okay that said it can still cause hormones you know side effects from the contraceptive drug but it does in some cases Mm -hmm. allow you to ovulate which is great okay so like the least worst option yeah (laughs) yeah and okay and to be fair, sometimes if women have had very, very heavy periods and it's either hormonal IUD or a hysterectomy, then mm. yeah, I have patients in that situation. That's honestly, yeah. 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 Which is another good point that, you know, I guess I'm really conscious of the fact that a lot of what I'm talking about is kind of a bog standard um, cycle that often doesn't have time to really take into account the nuances of, um, you know, what can make us all different. And I guess the The important thing is that um, in having conversations about cycles, every experience needs to be welcome and um, included because then, you know, it's it's all valid and it's it's all just sort of part of the experience. I agree. I will say, though, I've had this discussion a few times, there is still a healthy cycle. I mean, there is still, Mm. and I understand knowing Mm. that a lot of women are are not there yet you know that Mm. for whatever combination of reasons Mm -hmm. genetic in part there's different things that have pushed them away from a healthy cycle but I would Mm. say the the goal if you're in a female body if you can is to have regular ovulatory cycles and what that looks Mm. like is the parameters are should I just say you know say so the regular ovulation yeah you know technically a bleed coming within especially for younger women, every up to every 45 days is totally mm-hmm. normal as long as that's mm-hmm. ovulatory. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have to be a 28 day cycle at mm-hmm. all, but it should be somewhat regular. And of course, in our forties, we shorten our cycles shorten. So it mm-hmm. squishes down to like 21 days, which is pretty, that's part of the process, mm-hmm. but young women, longer cycles, and it, the bleed shouldn't be more than really should never be more than seven days. It shouldn't be more than 80 milliliters of menstrual Mm -hmm. fluid. It's about five tablespoons over all Mm -hmm. the days of the period. It shouldn't be painful. And when I say shouldn't, Mm. I don't mean if there is pain that you're a bad person or anything. I just mean there's something that is not right. Like there's something Mm. that could change because my, the bar, I have, you know, quite set quite a high bar of expectation for what periods can be like. And this is also coming from, for me, 25 years of full-time clinical practice, helping women mm. have better periods, it is almost always possible to either achieve a period like that, a symptomless period, or to come pretty close. You know, mm. there, there might some situations of, for example, I'll just I always have to mention it like extreme or severe endometriosis, that that's a little more complicated. Mm-hmm. But for most cases of PCOS, for most cases of premenstrual, mood for most cases of period pain for most cases of heavy period especially in younger women Mm. it is possible to achieve a symptomless regular normal healthy period like I'm describing it's Mm. it's a lot often a lot easier than you think it's it's the body wants to do it Mm. I love that and I love what you said earlier about helping people to trust their bodies that's really powerful so Lara's just um touched on a whole gamut of you know different ways that the cycle can present for you and if you're interested in exploring more about what she says then I really recommend reading the hormone repair manual because it is such um go on Lara well and for younger women the period repair manual so period repair manual that's is- actually what I was I, it's I had all good. that picture no, in my it's mind all good. yeah it's all good so period repair manual um yes. actually what I might do Lucy, because this will be edited. Is this going to be edited? Yeah. I should, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to grab the book. Okay. Like yeah. Grab super, the book. Super quick grab. Do it. Yeah. Yep, do it. <laughs> so yeah. show me your latest book. 
Oh, my latest. And your last book, your first book. <laughs> it's like two sisters. I'm getting them confused. Similar so, but different. Um, my book about how to have a healthy natural menstrual cycle without the use of hormonal birth control is Period Repair Manual. And yeah, Every Woman's Guide to Better Periods. And in that book, I talk a lot about some of the things we've been talking about today, the value of ovulation, um, how to know if you're ovulating, how to read your body's clues as to what your body might be trying to tell you with mm. period symptoms. Like, I think I have a section in chapter one called your body, your period's trying to tell you something. Mm. And that can be very useful as a way to just become healthier in general. Wonderful. And your book with the harnessing the powers oh. of the cycle. Yeah. The period queen. I think, I think we should hold up both books. Cause I think they look, I think they, they do well look, to, they, they do go look well good together. together. Yeah. My pink is picking up some of the accented pink in yours. Yeah. This is a little bit of, a <laughs> little bit of power yeah. here. It's probably the, uh, the pre-ovulatory power. <laughs> um, oh, look, I'm so glad that we've connected again. I, yeah, the, the last time we met, like you said, was in June back in 2019. And I remember it was a new moon and I remember I got my period and I wore on the stage this uh, red velvet dressing gown. And you had the flu. Oh, that's right. I did too. <laughs> yeah. Back, back when uh, it was uh, not shameful to have the flu. Oh, yeah, it was not, the, it was hundred percent. It was 2019. So it was in, in the, the olden days. Yeah. It was back in yeah. the olden days. Um, yeah. I remember it because you were, yeah, I was just thinking, oh, how sweet that you obviously kind of were in the mood that you would have liked to be home in bed. So there's an example of, you know, you probably should have been curled up in bed, but you came out to the event because, just because there's a chance to Oh, well, and... there was no way I wasn't going to go to the event, but I, <laughs> I, I tried to recreate being curled up in bed on stage. So we yes. had a velvet couch and I had my velvet dressing gown and I may have even had a hot water bottle and um, yeah. yeah, it was just so great to connect with you then and it's great to connect with you now and yeah I mean um I'm really looking for a non-clunky way to segue into talking about my online course and there isn't one so just I'll just do it let's just tell drop me it more. in here now tell yeah so yeah it's called explore your power and it's kind of it's it's giving people a deep dive into each of the four phases so dream do give take and about how you can support those phases um, emotionally and how they can support you and how you can channel them and how you can scaffold them for the month ahead. Because obviously, you know, just in a, like in a biological sense, each phase is feeding into the next one or flowing into the next one. And it's called a cycle for a reason. And if you take care of yourself here, when you're menstruating, you're going to have you know, a better cycle, you're going to have a better pre-ovulatory do phase. And if you take care of yourself in the do phase, you're going to have a better post-ovulatory phase. And if you take care of yourself all month long, you're going to have a less crunchy, pokey, prickly, um, trying not to swear, um, premenstrual take phase. So yeah, I just love this idea that um, people can do the course with their cycle so they can start it on day one and they can really just be in it while they're in it and have a little explore so beautiful yeah I love that yeah. idea yeah all right well I'm going to finish by just asking you two questions and mm. the first one is um so my latest obsession is chicken soup and I was reading how you often have chicken soup for breakfast and I just want to know what makes your chicken soup special my girlfriend last night was telling me they've got actual chickens and um they, there was a rooster and they killed the rooster and she said You've got no idea how good um, rooster stock is. I thought you said cock stock. That's, that's <laughs> funny. I think it was rooster stock. She was like, it's so good. Anyway, that's an aside. Tell me what makes your chicken soup the bomb. It's the fresh herbs from our garden. Mm. So we've got tarragon and sage and thyme. And yeah, we just, my husband loads it up. Actually, I, I literally, I had chicken soup this morning. So yeah, it's pretty real. <laughs> I have chicken mm. soup for breakfast a couple of times a week. If I can, mm. it usually involves mm. having cooked a chicken the night before. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> fresh herbs. All right. I will remember that. Mm -hmm. And the last question I want to ask you is what, actually it's the second last question. What would your 
you know, you've achieved menopause. You're now a menopausal woman. That's right, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. You're yeah. not post-menopausal. You are menopausal. Yep. I'm in the life phase called menopause. The 30-year, exactly. well, hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, 30-year life phase. Lara, I can totally <laughs> see you cracking the century. I don't want you to put any <laughs> limits on yourself, okay? Now, um, I'm wondering what you think your 90-year-old self would say to you Ooh. about this next part of your life. I know the th phrase that popped into my head is just, you know, just walk more. <laughs> if in doubt, in my case, you know, walk more and also, you know, hug tightly to the mm. people you love. This is, I mean, this is, I know this is very cliche, but this, especially the, the rather traumatic couple of years mm. that we've just mm -hmm. had, you really, mm. who is, who are those people that you need mm. to hug and don't wait? Just mm. like, don't put it off, <laughs> do it mm. while you can. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you need? That's what I want to finish on. What mm -hmm. do you need today for the rest of the day? You're in the afternoon, aren't you, in Christchurch? What do you need? I mean, I, I need to go outside. It's a beautiful day, right? I'm just as I'm even as I'm sitting, watch you know, talking to you. I'm like, oh my goodness, the you know, the sky turned blue, and it's this autumn evening. Mm -hmm. So. I often need to get outside. For me, that's been part of the second girlhood that I explore a little bit in my second book. So, yeah. Lara Bryden, I'm so happy to speak with you and to imagine you in your second girlhood getting outside in the herbs and the bumblebees and the blue autumn sky. And thank you so much for chatting. Thank you, Lucy Peach. It was great. Thanks again. Hi, I'm Lucy Peach, and I want you to explore your power the powers, the powers in your menstrual cycle. I want to help you get to the bottom of what is amazing about you in each phase. Dream, do, give, take. So if you've started tracking and you're ready to go deeper, this is for you. We're going to be looking at each phase and how to support it, the challenges, because there are some, how to channel the power that comes with each of the phases in your month, and how to really get to the bottom of what is amazing about you so that you can be supported and empowered all month long.